for access to vaccines. I'm particularly welcome to the three witnesses for our first session. Um, I'm really pleased that we have with us Professor Kate O'Brien, who is um, Director of the Department of Immunization, Vaccines and Biologicals at the WHO. We have uh, Professor Andrew Pollard um, from the University of Oxford, Professor of Pediatric Infection and Immunity at the University of Oxford. And we have um, Gavin Yamey from <clears throat> Duke University who serves on two international health commissions, the Lancet Commission on Investing in Health and the Lance Commission on Global Surgery. So you are all incredibly welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I will kick off the uh, first set of questions. We, um, we have 45 minutes for this session, which was always quite ambitious. So if I could ask you if you could keep your um, answers as succinct as possible, that would be uh, wonderful. So my first question really um, is, we have seen almost, I think 1.4 billion vaccine doses administered worldwide, but only 0.3% of those have been administered in low income countries. So in your view, are countries taking enough of a global view towards vaccine supply and production? And secondly, what risk does that gap between vaccination programs in different countries actually pose to public health here in the UK? And maybe if I could put that question to um, Professor O'Brien to begin with. So um, thanks for really pointing out this enormous gap in equity between vaccine distribution and access um, in high income countries compared with low income countries. I think what really is important here is that countries have started right over 209 countries, territories, economies have begun their vaccination program. Um, so it's not about getting started. It's about whether or not there is sufficient access uh, vaccines for countries to continue their program in order to deliver to the highest risk populations, which have been the priority for 2021 delivery. Um, the, the risk that this poses, um, this gap in vaccination program coverage, where some countries, including the UK, are advancing well beyond that highest priority group, um, even um, now considering in some countries uh, immunization of children, um, which is really about a transmission um, uh, objective. Uh, and, and where we have this really uh, very substantial gap between what some countries are achieving in terms of access and immunization, while at the same time other countries are um, at the very beginning of covering those highest priority groups, it means that we have a situation epidemiologically um, where the risk of transmission, the risk of disease, the risk of the, of the pathogen um, is, is very, very heterogeneous. And it poses, of course, risks for every country for variants of concern, the progression of um, uh, selection pressure um, for, for different variants. And from an economic perspective, we are so interconnected around the world that the recovery of the economy domestically is dependent on a recovery globally as well. And so these are, this is not about um, really a, a moral argument or a charitable argument. It's about an epidemiologic, a biologic, an economic, and a social recovery um, that affects every country around the world. Um, and I think that's for me, the sort of biggest argument here this is really about timing of when doses are coming. The co we'll get into more discussion around the COVAX facility, which does have a sight line towards um, 2 billion doses for this year, over 3 billion and onwards for next year. Um, but it's really about when those doses come. Um, and that's the urgent issue right now that has to be addressed immediately, not months and months from now, but in weeks and, and in the next month, when are those doses going to come and how can we assure that they will come? Thank you. That's, that's very, very clear. Um, Professor Pollard, is there anything you would like to add to that? I, well, I, I mean, I, I, obviously I'd completely echo the comments that, that Kate um, has made. Um, I, you know, I think when, when you uh, look at the overall aim of a global vaccination program um, in a pandemic, it's to stop people dying. And we know who those people are. That's the over 50s. It's uh, those who've got um, health conditions and to some extent also healthcare workers. And so those are the priority groups as they, they are 
initially here in the UK and the, the, the global ones through uh, the World Health Organization's um, policy recommendations. And yet we are in a situation at the moment where there are many unvaccinated people in the world, but not enough doses for everyone yet, but there are many unvaccinated people in the world whilst people at risk um, that's extremely low of disease are being vaccinated. And as, as Kate mentioned, including children who have near to zero risk of severe disease or death. And so that, that inequity is, is absolutely um, plain to see at this moment in, in, a, in actually a very troubling way, um, as we see the images from South Asia on our television screens of, of the awful circumstances there. And I, I work in, in Nepal and Bangladesh and colleagues there um, are just facing the most appalling circumstances. They, they're not working in a, in a situation where there's an NHS to support them. Um, and I, I just, it feels completely wrong to be in a situation morally, first of all, where we, we're allowing that to happen, uh, whilst in many countries, vaccines are being rolled out to younger and younger populations at very, very low risk. And, and I certainly also agree with the, the other point, that the health security one, um, that if, if we have better distribution of vaccines, that there is some downward pressure on variants of concern, and that's going to be helpful for us all in the future. Um, and also the, the economic argument is clear. If health systems in other countries are not overburdened, then we don't have a pandemic anymore and the economies everywhere start to improve. So I think that this is, this is perhaps the most critical bit in, in many ways is that we've, we've sort of lost um, uh, the direct line of sight of what we're trying to do to end a pandemic and that's to stop the pressure on health systems. And that's not just here in the UK, that's in all countries. And you only do that by focusing the doses you have on those who are at risk of going into hospital. Lovely. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, Gavin Yemi, anything you would like to add? Yeah, I mean, just to echo both of those points, but also to add, the idea behind COVAX was that we would vaccinate health workers and high-risk people first in every nation, about 20% of the population in every nation. Rich nations rejected that idea. I mean, wholesale rejection of that idea. Um, and they hoarded doses. They went into advanced purchase agreements directly with manufacturers. They rejected COVAX, they rejected multilateralism, they rejected justice. And that's the situation we find ourselves in. And so I understand the concern from Professor O'Brien and Professor Pollard that we're vaccinating children but we crossed that Rubicon a very, very long time ago. We started vaccinating low risk adults way before vaccinating health workers and high risk people uh, in low and middle income countries. You know, we crossed, that, we crossed that a very long time ago. Now we find ourselves in a situation, of course, where rich nations are not only hoarding doses, the best estimates are that there are somewhere between two and 300 million doses ready to go now that rich nations are holding on to, but some nations are also blocking lower middle income countries from making their own doses. So rich nations are both hoarding and blocking. And it's absolutely true. We need the charity model. We need rich nations to donate doses, um, but that's a charity model. You know, that's a sort of crumbs from a rich person's table model, and it's not a sustainable model. And we need to be looking to the future into 2022 and beyond. This pandemic, unfortunately, is gonna be with us for years in low and middle income countries. And for that, I have argued as have many people, including of course, Dr. Tedros, WHO uh, Director General, that we need to support low and middle income countries to make their own vaccines, an intellectual property waiver, tech transfer, support for manufacturing at the source. Yes. This sort of trickle down approach where we hope you know, a few doses will trickle down from rich nations to less wealthy nations. Those days have surely got to be numbered. We need to support countries themselves to make their own doses. So donations now, yes, charity now, um, but sustainability into the future. That's what I would add. Thank you. We'll definitely be getting more into the detail of that very shortly. But thank you so much for that. I'll hand the, um, the, the, the voice over now to Baroness Masham for question three. Uh, my question is, what are the key barriers to distributing the vaccine across the world? And what, in your view, is the most pressing problem that must be addressed? People are so worried they won't get the vaccine. 
Um, who would like to answer that? You can start um, and, and I'll be happy to hand over uh, for additional um, comments. I'm eager to hear what, what everybody has to say about this. I think it's really clear what the immediate barriers are right now. I, I don't think there's much ambiguity on that. Um, just reflecting what, what, what has been said in the previous question, the supply agreements that are in place um, are largely, the vast majority of them are by high income countries. Um, and the issue around being able to assure that doses move now urgently, not in, not in six months, not in a year, but move doses um, so that they are accessible through COVAX to an equitable allocation across the, the many countries that are part of COVAX is really the, the critical issue. And what this is about is about actions by the manufacturers, actions by countries that have bilateral deals with manufacturers, actions by countries who can release doses that are um, doses they have access to and can be shared with COVAX now. Um, it also means that manufacturers will facilitate that sharing of doses. There are contractual arrangements between bilateral deals that the manufacturers have to agree to for the release of those doses. So those are actions that manufacturers can take, countries with bilateral deals can take, fully funding the COVAX facility so that the COVAX facility has the resources to continue to do deals. Um, and it is a release of raw materials for manufacturing. And this has been a call that has been made to assure that manufacturing that is going on right now uh, can be completed and can move those doses. And then finally, in, in the more medium term is this issue of increasing manufacturing in a broader range of countries. Those, those issues around IP, a TRIPS waiver, uh, manufacturing capacity, those are not going to be immediate term um, increasing in doses. It's very important, but for this very immediate term, it really is about countries allowing manufacturers to put COVAX first in the line, secondly, releasing doses that they already have access to, third is raw material um, uh, uh, release as well, and, and finally, funding fully funding COVAX. Thank you very much. And Professor Andrew? Uh, yes, I, I mean, I think uh, Kate has very nicely summarised the, the, the key issues. And, and you know, I think it's important to, to focus on you know, what the urgency, um, which I, I, I think um, Kate said in, in her first response, um, that according to the Institute of Health Metrics um, in Seattle, um, uh, over 800,000 people will die from COVID this month during, during May. And those people are, are mostly older adults um, in countries that don't have access um, to vaccine at the moment. So it, the, the urgency is, is actually not around waivers and so on. It's around what we can do with the doses that are being manufactured today but to try to have um, an impact um, on that. And I, I think it's absolutely right that the, the funding needs to be there um, and you know, but waiting, for example, for the G7 next month is too late for the people who are going to die in the meantime. And so there's an absolute urgency about dealing with some of these, these issues now. Um, the longer term issues um, are very complicated. They, uh, and, and I think to the, the sim there's a simplistic argument around the IP waiver, which I think absolutely is, is a good direction of travel. But there's, there's a complexity around that. Um, in that just simply having intellectual property rights doesn't make a vaccine. It, it, there's a huge and um, heavy lift of uh, transferring the technology to make these very complex products. And I, I mean, I, uh, as someone involved in vaccine development, have, have a personal experience of this, um, in that in, here at the University of Oxford, our um, vision was to try to develop a vaccine that was globally available. And if you look at what, what you might get from uh, sharing intellectual property rights, having that waiver, it would be distributed manufacturing around the world, um, a big heavy lift of technology transfer to multiple sites. And of course, that's what in partnership with AstraZeneca we've been able to do. We've got more than 20 manufacturing sites um, around the world and they are um, making vaccines. There's an enormous amount of work going on day and night now 
um, to help each of those sites improve the yields they're getting to scale um, the amount of production. And that, that scale has been going on for 12 months now um, of activity to do that. And if we don't start that today with lots of other developers, next year we'll still be in this situation. So we've got to be doing that. There's a great model that we have at the moment and through the AstraZeneca vaccine of how you can do that across huge numbers of manufacturing sites. Um, and that's why the main supplier to COVAX so far has been um, from that vaccine. Of course, it's complicated now and because of the enormous tragedy in, in South Asia, which means a lot of doses are being focused there. And so COVAX has got much uh, greater shortage of supply. But, but I, I think we, we've got to be careful not to be too simplistic about the waiver itself is not the whole answer. You've also got to have a huge capacity required to make sure that the quality of product in each of those manufacturing sites is, is the same. We don't want just to hand over recipes which then um, undermine confidence in vaccines because of quality. So uh, it's, it's an investment across the whole of that. It, it, it's, it, we have to be careful not to be too simplistic about what we're asking for. Thank you for stressing the urgency. And now Gavin Yami. Yes, just, uh, just to say, I don't know whose quote this is, but I love it, which is that the IP waiver is like publishing the recipe. Uh, tech transfer is like having the master chef in your kitchen showing you how to make the vaccine. I think that is very important. Really, it's, it, it's a two-part solution that uh, Professor O'Brien and Professor Pollard have mentioned. The first part has to be donating the doses that are available now. We don't have great estimates. You probably saw the very big story we're all talking about in the New York Times, suggesting that about 1.7 billion doses have been manufactured in total. 1.5 billion have been administered. So we know that there's 200 million doses that are not being used right now that could be do donated to COVAX right now to get shots in arms. That's, I think, the most urgent thing possible. Those are doses that could be administered right now. Last week or two weeks ago, I was at a panel and Seth Berkley, the CEO of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, he also reminded us that rich nations have entered into large purchase agreements for future doses, right? Procurement of future doses. And he estimates that uh, rich nations have procured an additional 1.5 billion excess doses. They're not sitting there now in a fridge, but they procured those. Um, and you've probably seen the numbers. Canada's procured enough to vaccinate its entire population four or five or six times over. Uh, UK, US, not far behind. They need to release those agreements and make sure those doses go to COVAX. That's the urgent part. And then, as Professor Pollard said, there are discussions now about making one's own doses. And that is not, I mean, that's not something that's going to happen today. Uh, you know, I wrote a piece in the BMJ with Greg Gonsalves at Yale last week, supporting the notion of what we call a people's vaccine. But we recognize that that's, you know, at best, something that will start producing vaccines towards the end of the year, early next year, six to eight months away. And that's a three-legged stool. That is the, the recipe, you know, the IP, the tech transfer, the master chef, and of course, support for manufacturing, none of which is easy. I mean, you know, I don't make vaccines, but I've seen some of the, the manuals alert. I mean, it's thousands and tens and thousands of pages of engineering and process engineering. It's not something that happens overnight. And I agree, you know, just saying we need an IP waiver, that's not enough. It has to be the full three-legged stool. One last thing I would say, though, is that I am, uh, I'm old enough to remember these battles around antiretroviral drugs where, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, there was a big concern that if you release the IP, you release the patents, you know, the world would, would fall apart, the sky would fall down, big pharma would go out of business. None of that, of course, happened. And, you know, the, the ability for, for low and middle income countries to make their own doses and expand access to antiretrovirals and, you know, keep millions of people alive was a remarkable uh, shift in, in the global HIV uh, AIDS landscape and, you know, the large pharmaceutical companies have remained profitable. So I don't think sometimes the argument is that, you know, we need patents to innovate, but that's simply, that, that's absolutely not the whole story. Of course, many companies got large amounts of public money as well. So I think, you know, I'm very sympathetic to the idea of an IP waiver. I totally agree with Professor Pollard. It's not going to suddenly make doses overnight, but I think the urgency is around the doses now 
then we need a long-term sustainable, justice-oriented, equitable model where countries can make vaccines for themselves. Thank you all very much. Yes, thank you. It's a really rich discussion. Um, I'm just slightly mindful of time. So if I can ask going forward, if we can be even um, uh, crisper, that would be, that would be amazing. Um, if I could hand the floor now to Lord Strasberger. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, good morning. Um, Professor O'Brien, could you tell us if scaling up the COVID-19 virus production, uh, vaccine production uh, could impact on the production of other vaccines? So this is such an important question and we've been looking carefully at uh, whether or not we're um, sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul and in essence, are we going to end up with shortages of the vaccines that are also life-saving vaccines against um, largely childhood, but also um, adult diseases uh, that, and, and essentially will end up with um, uh, deaths that, uh, that could have been prevented if we fail to have the adequate supply. At this point, we don't see those vaccine shortages either on the horizon or in actuality. Um, most of the manufacturers who are um, producing let's call them routine vaccines, um, inclusive of adolescent vaccines and adult vaccines are involved in COVID vaccine development and production, but we don't see that either the raw materials or the actual production lines are being compromised um, uh, for COVID vaccine. Now that's a, that is a, a relatively fragile situation that we're in also because um, we are seeing that the supply flexibility is now much narrower um, and there uh, is the potential for stockouts and supply issues moving forward. So this needs to be watched really carefully, but we aren't in a situation right now where we're ringing the alarm bell or foreseeing that we need to ring the alarm bell um, for that purpose. Again, that's a situation now and especially as demand for COVID vaccines increases especially as we anticipate, will booster doses be needed? Is this a one-off program where we need to vaccinate everybody around the world and there will be durable immunity? Or are we in a situation where we're actually gonna have to set up programs that have to do this scale of immunization year in and year out? And that's too early to tell at this point, but there's a lot of different scenarios, the way COVID could play out and the way that the vaccine programs are gonna to have to respond to this, both from a manufacturing capacity perspective and from a delivery perspective. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Yemi or Professor Pollard, do you have anything you want to add to that? Just, just a, a very brief comment for a slightly different perspective. And, and that is um, from uh, the, the view that most vaccines that, that we're talking about here are being delivered to children and uh, the whereas children are relatively unaffected by COVID, um, the immunization program that there is around the world is absolutely critical for their health. And one of the, the problems of the pandemic has been the disruption of health systems and the impact that has on childhood immunization programs. So although, as Kate says, at the moment, there isn't a supply problem with the vaccines, there is a big problem in many countries of the disruption of health systems and actually protecting children from diseases that they are now getting that they shouldn't be because we do have vaccines to prevent them. Thank you. Minera, did you want to come in? Minera Wilson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, there's there have been reports that um, in terms of boosting manufacturing capacity, obviously a lot of the um, COVID vaccine manufacturers have gone into partnerships with other companies, uh, with some of their competitors in some cases, to produce uh, more vaccine. Uh, and with contract manufacturers. However, um, discussions with large generics manufacturers, for instance, Teva, which is the world's biggest uh, generics manufacturer, and therefore has the capacity and arguably the capability to produce these vaccines, um, they've been knocked back. I just wondered if any of the panelists had any reflections on why they think that might be, because that would seem to be uh, a reasonably uh, quick, if, if not immediate, but certainly medium term solution to boosting capacity. Anyone with thoughts on that? Um, I, I don't have any particular knowledge about uh, individual um, uh, uh, arrangements with, with different um, manufacturing organisations, but the, uh, the, the manufacturing that we're involved in is 
uh, with contract manufacturing organizations that have the capability to make these very complex biologics. And I, I think it's, it is important to, to understand that these are really difficult um, types of um, uh, medical products to make. And, and although uh, the point about the, uh, the HIV um, drugs is well made, that they're a very different type of technology from a biological one um, in terms of the manufacturing process. So I, I don't know with, with that capacity whether it's, it is appropriate or not for, for biological manufacturing, um, for whether it's for, for the, uh, the, and of course there's many different types of vaccines being made at the moment. Um, around the world. But I don't know, Kate, whether you have more insight into that. Yeah, I just actually, I really want to reinforce the point that you've made, because there are so many analogies that are being made to the situation um, years ago with HIV uh, drugs. And, and I do think it's important just to underline this point, producing pharmaceutical products, drugs, which are chemicals, is a really different scale and complexity to producing a biological product. They are not the same in terms of just being able to tech transfer the knowledge, the know-how, the expertise, and what it actually takes to make a biological, as opposed to, if I can use the word, a chemical, um, which is a, you know, a drug substance. This, these are really, really different. They are not analogous. And so although there are some parallels about some of the, um, the, the geopolitics and, and the IP issues, the actual nuts and bolts of can any manufacturer do this? Uh, you know, is that know-how something that is scalable and transferable in a short period of time? Um, I just really want to emphasize what Andy has pointed out. We are talking about biologicals here, which are not the same as drugs. Thank you very much. <laughs> May I push back very, very slightly? It's always good to have a bit of disagreement. I mean, I'm, I certainly have less expertise than either Professor Pollard or Professor O'Brien, but I worry a little bit that we're arguing, you know, that low and middle income countries don't have the know-how, the capacity, the expertise. Um, we've already seen production of, of COVID-19 vaccines in low and middle income. We hear from so many manufacturers in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh and Indonesia, they're ready, they're hungry, they're waiting. You know, they've got some capacity. It is true that it is not the same as making antiretroviral, but it is also something that can be uh, transfer that that knowledge, that IP, that you know, that know-how can be transferred. And I do worry that if we continue to say it's just too difficult, only rich countries, only big companies in the north can make these vaccines, then we're going to be in the same position next year with rich nations continuing to hoard. I worry that they're going to hoard because of boosters. Honestly, that is a big fear that I have that rich countries will still hoard because of the booster issue. And so I really think we need to acknowledge that it's fine to continue donating, but there has to be a long-term vision. This pandemic could be with us for years. Is it really just gonna be charity, you know, drip, drip, drip of a few doses from rich countries? That's not a, a long-term vision. Yeah, so I just, let me, let me just reply to that. And I think it's a really important point and, and not to be misunderstood. This is not an argument about not proceeding with developing manufacturing in a variety of a much broader set of countries. I think it's just setting expectations for the pace with which this manufacturing yeah. scaling can, can actually be successful in addressing the problem, um, that it actually is a portfolio approach to addressing this problem. And much of the manufacturing that is referred to around the world, at least some of it, is really about fill finish. It's not actually about manufacturing biologicals. And that's the thing that needs to scale. That's the thing that really needs to be developed um, in a much broader number of countries in order to achieve that supply security for biologicals. But if, if people are thinking that this is something that's going to be done on the turn of a dime, they're incorrect. It's not going to be. Um, it really is of a different scale and complexity. And that's what needs to be invested in so that we so that that manufacturing is in Africa, is in other parts of the world where we don't have um, scalable vaccine manufacturing to any great degree. Thank you very, very much. Um, over to uh, Baroness Brinton. Thank you very much. You've partly answered the question I was going to ask, but not in completely. So all three of you, thank you very much for explaining the complexity 
of transfer of IP and and uh, the story of AstraZeneca and, and Oxford working in other countries to make sure that the fulfillment of, of the doses is something that's clearly going. And I, I'm minded to, uh, uh, to cite Professor Sarah Gilbert's evidence to the Science and Technology Select Committee back in February, where she laid that out very clearly. So I'm going to change my question and say, Given this complexity, how do we move away from society in uh, countries like ours saying either click your fingers and do trips waiver now and it'll all be all right versus the government saying we've donated money to COVAX, therefore it will all be all right? Where would you like to direct that? Uh, I think we'll start with Gavin, actually. Thanks. That's a great question. So obviously I'm hugely supportive of rich nations donating to COVAX money. Um, I would argue that money is not the issue right now. And as I think we've heard earlier, the supply is the issue. Um, what I would, I mean, obviously it's a bit pointless going back in time, but really what should have happened is that as rich nations were vaccinating their own citizens, they would donate to COVAX at the same time. That's the Norway approach. We saw that New Zealand has agreed to donate enough doses to vaccinate 800,000 people in lower middle income countries through COVAX. France will donate 500,000. So these are all, I think, going to be more important right now, these donations, than the money. There's no point COVAX sitting on millions of dollars if there's no doses to use that money for, you know, to actually buy. Um, you know, I'm going to be on TV a little bit later talking about Biden's offer yesterday to donate 20 million doses by the end of June. We don't know exactly where they're going to go, pr presumably many to India. That's on top of another 60 million that he, that he agreed to donate earlier. Those are all very welcome. I have to say what I think would be really good would be this all to me seems a little bit haphazard. It doesn't really seem like there's an overarching strategic way forward, a sort of joined up multilateral way forward. You've got the IP waiver. Great. But, you know, what next? You've got a little bit of, of, of donations here and there. You've got talk of boosting manufacturing capacity. You've got some mumbling about you know, export restrictions and, and addressing those. Some, some people are talking about the raw materials. What there doesn't seem to be is a sort of, well, what's the overarching roadmap here and how are we gonna make this happen? And I worry that it's very disjointed. Again, great that Biden is giving 20 million. You know, it's very little, very late. There's over a billion people in India. But it, what, what's, what, what I see as, as being missing is a, is a sort of what's the overarching multilateral joined up strategy to end this pandemic as soon as possible. Does anyone else want to come in? Professor yes, maybe I would like to come in on this and, and thanks for opening that, that topic up, Gavin, um, in the reply. I, I would push back a little bit. I think there is, a, there is a strategy. There is an approach here. It's called COVAX. COVAX has 4 billion doses that it has a sight line to. Um, through uh, available supply that has uh, been either committed or is in negotiation. And the so the, there is no simple solution to this, but the COVAX is the means. Uh, it is the, the coordinated means to allocate and distribute doses uh, to countries around the world. The 92 advanced market commitment countries plus self-financing countries, and we really should not forget about them, the upper middle income countries that alone are not gonna be able to do the kinds of deals that they would like to have. Um, countries that are left out of the advanced market commitment really need access as well. And so that this is the means. Now, the question is, how do you get the doses into COVAX? One is it has to have funding. It doesn't have a treasury sitting behind it like a sovereign nation does. And that was one of the issues early on with COVAX is getting the funding accessible to actually do the deals, which meant that COVAX was lower in the lineup of uh, actually the, the procurement of those doses. So we wanna fix that. We wanna assure that COVAX has the funds now to be able to do the deals to secure the supply for 2022 and beyond. The second thing is this urgency of getting doses now. And that's where the sharing of doses comes in. These are not excess doses or leftover doses from countries. What we're saying is um, sharing doses when you're well along in your prioritization, uh, vaccination of priority groups. And then the third thing is the world does not have enough manufacturing capacity. And that's where 
that scaling of manufacturing comes in to assure that it's, it is distributed more broadly around different countries to serve COVAX for sure, but to serve countries that are doing bilateral deals as well. So it's several prongs of solution that are needed in order to have a, a pathway forward to assure that in 2022 and, and very much in 2021, we're making very substantial progress on ending this pandemic. And I think we have to come back to Andy's point that the reason that we need all of this is we have a pandemic where people are dying, health systems continue to be overwhelmed, and that's the urgent thing to address in 2021. So COVAX is the coordinated joined up solution and to get supply in are these sub areas of funding, manufacturing capacity, sharing of doses now urgently so that we can actually get moving to implement that strategy in a much deeper way than we've been able to. COVAX should have been delivering over 160 million doses by now. Of course, the India situation has, is what has constrained uh, the, the supply along with some difficulties in some of the manufacturers to deliver what they anticipated in terms of their supply. But the sight line is there for, for getting billions of doses where they need to be. That is the joined up um, equitable allocation approach. We, we really need to let COVAX work. And that means getting doses into COVAX, funding into COVAX to assure that we can be planning for 2022 as well. I'm going to move us on if that's all right, just because I'm worried about time. Professor Pollock, can you wrap up anything into the next question if I can go to Philippa next, because I'm sure it will still be um, relevant. Philippa Whitford. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, if I could start with Professor Pollard, uh, two questions. Is it right that we should consider vaccination of young people or even children in areas with rising cases of the Indian variant? And with the failure to take a global response and low income countries not even getting enough vaccine to vaccinate their healthcare workers, are we not just prolonging the pandemic and increasing the risk that major outbreaks will generate yet more variants, which in turn will come back and uh, harm the UK? Well, I, I, I think uh, the, the answer is, is there in your question. I, I mean, a, absolutely, um, we, we can expect new variants um, to occur. And I, I think we also have to take a, a perspective about the, what you would anticipate from viral evolution. Um, and that as we vaccinate more people, and we will have a virus that evolves anyway and is able to continue to transmit in vaccinated populations. So I think it's unlikely that this coronavirus will disappear um, in the next decade. It'll, it'll still be around, but hopefully it won't be a public health problem um, in the future. So th there, is, there is an aspect at the moment of the, the reason for getting um, people around the world protected is partly to, to reduce the um, uh, new variants arising and causing these new surges in disease. Um, but in, in the long run, it, we are still going to have the virus with us. So it's, you know, I, I don't think the whole aim should be to, to focus on new variants because they are going to be here um, in years to come. The, the main issue at this moment, as, as we've been discussing, is to, to try and make sure the doses go to those in greatest need. And so uh, going to younger and younger individuals, including children, it are groups who are not at the greatest need. In the greatest need are the many people in the world who are unvaccinated and will die in the next uh, couple of months. And, and you would say that even with obviously the areas within the UK that are starting to see exponential rise of the Indian variant, you, you don't think that's an approach because some people are talking about that. Well, I, I, if you're purely looking at the, at the domestic question, then expanding to, to wider age groups makes sense but we, we shouldn't be doing that, as, as we discussed at the beginning. Uh, we, th this is a, a global problem um, that affects um, our um, health security, it affects our economies, and it's the pressures on health systems. So sure, here in, in the UK, the, the real gap uh, is uh, the older adults and those with, with other health conditions who are not yet vaccinated. They're the ones who are most likely to end up in hospital. And we absolutely need to make sure we're doing better at um, getting to those individuals who are not yet vaccinated. And we know there are um, a, a small um, but substantial enough proportion to, to be a problem. So that group needs to be targeted still. Um, but beyond that, we, we really should be thinking about this global equity issue that's been discussed. 
if I can come to, to Gavin, obviously, as you said, there was a lot of warm words last spring that haven't been borne out. Do you have anything to add about the risk of both cases and variants then coming back and threatening the high income countries? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very good question. I have to say, um, maybe I, I, I'm always slightly uncomfortable with the question because yes, it's absolutely true. I think we should act because we're international community based on justice, based on equity. We can't see what's happening in India and not want to act for that reason alone. On the other hand, you're absolutely right that it is also in our enlightened self-interest to act. There's no doubt about that. And, you know, variants of concern are more likely days when there is uncontrolled transmission. We've seen that in places like Brazil with P1 in South Africa, uh, in India and, and elsewhere, and in Britain, of course. So there is an additional reason, an outbreak. I mean, the, the adage is that an outbreak anywhere can become an outbreak everywhere. So we have to act on that reason alone. And then, as Professor O'Brien said earlier, there's an economic reason to act. One Turkish study estimates that if rich nations are more or less vaccinated by the end of the summer and poorer nations are left behind, there's going to be a nine trillion dollar global economic loss. Half of that will be borne by rich nations because of export reduction and supply chain disruption. So it's in our economic interests. Um, to act as well. And one last thing, just to come back to Professor O'Brien, I agree 100%. COVAX is the only multilateral game in town. I didn't mean to not imply that. I was in the working group, the unpaid advisory group that helped to design COVAX. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm passionate about COVAX. My frustration is that it, you know, is that the vision that we had, when the vision that we had was that we would have protected every health worker by now, every high risk person by now. So it's been very frustrating. My frustration has, is born out of the fact that so many countries bypass COVAX. But Professor O'Brien is right. We need, to, we need to get COVAX back on track. That is absolutely the case. It's the only mechanism that is thinking about equity combined with public health need, additional doses to where there are hotspots, but vaccinate health workers, high-risk people in every nation first, um, and then expand as we go on. And I know I'm already out of time. The last thing is, I think, you know, here we started to vaccinate children in the US. I think I have a slightly different view to Professors Pollard and O'Brien. I've talked to a lot of global child health experts who say the platform for delivering vaccines in low and middle income countries is amazing, incredible. Decades of investment into this brilliant child vaccine platform, partly funded by Gavi. Reaching vaccine herd immunity in these settings might actually be quicker if we include children. I think we shouldn't exclude that possibility. Thank you very much. And, uh, Kate O'Brien, have you anything to add? Obviously, it's been money to COVAX, but not so many doses. Yeah, I think the, uh, listen, the, the commitment to COVAX is, is seen also um, by countries who have funded COVAX, 192 uh, have committed to COVAX. So I think there has been a very firm and clear commitment to COVAX. But countries that could do their bilateral deals chose a, a two-pronged approach to this. And the, the depth and, and, and vigor with which countries pursued bilateral deals um, is, is certainly an issue that has meant that about 20% of the global supply is going through COVAX, the much greater proportion of it is going through bilateral deals, which has driven up prices. It has constrained um, the, the, the lever that COVAX is. However, uh, it, does, it does demonstrate the commitment of donor countries and of countries that are procuring their vaccines through COVAX. And I think our big message here is that, especially on the childhood vaccination issue, the goal of transmission reduction is a goal that is a, a laudable goal. We, uh, all of us as vaccine people would, would pursue that goal eventually. But the point is that one that we, I think we have to keep coming back to, we are in the, the, we have not achieved the goal of reducing mortality and severe disease from COVID uh, around the world. That has to be the primary goal at this point. And we have to achieve that before we move on to these other goals of transmission interruption or transmission reduction. And so it, it is this, this disconnect between some countries pursuing a goal um, that is much further along while other countries are still at the very beginning of achieving that death reduction, 
health system protection, reducing severe disease. And I think that's really where we have to focus um, our attention and assure that we achieve that in 2021, which means uh, advancing where we are now with supply. All many, many things have happened in terms of the supply that were unforeseen. And so we just have to address these issues as they're right in front of us. And that means dose sharing, um, manufacturing, manufacturers prioritizing getting doses to COVAX. That means countries releasing manufacturers from their supply obligation timing um, and cooperation with COVAX to um, advance the supply that is available for that equitable distribution. Thank you. And can I just jump in and say, and, and the evidence is not yet there, and um, the vaccinating children will achieve that transmission goal. I think it would be very unwise to focus doses in lower middle income countries to children at this stage, because the evidence is that this is not influenza, where we know vaccinating children has a big impact on spread in the population. That, that is just not the case with coronavirus. So we, we must not, not uh, leave that one unsaid. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. I'm going to come finally now on this session to Lord Russell. Yes, uh, thank you to all three of you. I mean, this has been a, an incredibly rich and helpful session. If one tries to distill this down to a key message each of you would give directly to the UK government, what would it be? Could I start with Professor O'Brien? What would your advice be? My advice would be to fully commit to COVAX. Uh, the UK government has already been a strong donor, a very generous donor to COVAX, but I think we need a recommitment to COVAX. And I think it's about dose sharing and the, and the emphasis that the UK government can, can make and play both um, as a as a government and as an influencer of other governments. I think it's about the here and now, about what needs to happen now, while also keeping the, the rest of 2021 and 2022 in a sight line uh, for a commitment to COVAX. Thank you. Professor Pollard? I, I think uh, it's, it's about this urgency. That there's there's a, a, a huge risk of uh, many millions dying between now and September. We, we can't wait um, until later in the year to make decisions. It, it actually has to be now that we look at redistribution and how do we get doses to uh, those countries that have poor access at the moment. And that is through COVAX. That's, that's where we have to focus on those efforts. But absolute urgency. It's not something we can wait to make a decision on later in the year. Thank you. And Dr. Jamie? Yeah, I don't have much to add. Shots in arms now. There are hundreds of millions of unused doses. Get them into arms now um, to reduce mortality. Um, but there is a longer term picture. And I would argue that there's a window of opportunity here, a sort of COVID-19 as a Trojan horse, if you like, to build a global manufacturing, uh, a globalized manufacturing that could stand ready for future pandemics. It could be used you know, to develop other medicines, diagnostics and so on. So I think combining the urgency of donating now with a longer term vision um, is something the UK should champion. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much to uh, all of our three witnesses from that first session. That was incredibly rich and helpful. Um, very many thanks. You're very welcome to stay if you would like for the second session, but I appreciate how busy you are. And I know Gavin, you said you had to go and do your school run. So uh, thank school you run. so much for, uh, for being with us in particular. Um, and now moving on, let me welcome our four witnesses for the second session. I know some of you've been here from the start as well, so you'll have heard that, um, that debate that we've had so far. I want to welcome um, Ava Kadili from UNICEF. She's director of UNICEF Supply Division. Uh, Heidi Chow from Global Justice Now. Uh, Natasha Loder, who is The Economist's health policy editor. And Els Tarila from the University College uh, London working on innovation and public purpose. You're all uh, incredibly welcome. I will press straight on because we're running slightly late and I'll come straight away to Baroness Brinton. Uh, thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, the sharing of IP, as we've heard uh, in the first session, has attracted a lot of attention. Is this enough? And in your view, is this the most pressing issue that has to be overcome in order to ensure COVID-19 vaccines are accessible across the world? Um, Ava, could we start with you, please? Sure, thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. I think it's a very nice segue from the first session, as we heard before. Uh, what I would like to say is that uh, uh, as UNICEF, we absolutely welcome all efforts to lift 
any barriers uh, that can actually stop growing or diversifying COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing capacity. But um, one way achieving this is absolutely via a voluntary and proactive uh, licensing by holders of the intellectual property rights. This will enable more manufacturing to make more vaccines. Another way is to subcontract to manufacturers, uh, really moving all the barriers such as geographic or volume restrictions. Um, and we have seen great examples when we are benefiting as COVAX, as UNICEF uh, from these examples, but absolutely more is needed. However, IP sharing alone is not sufficient. We, on, we heard uh, just before that uh, we really need technology transfers, we really need uh, sharing of know-how, and we need investments on the spare and uh, of uh, manufacturing capacity, also scaling up this manufacturing capacity. All of this is needed together to make this working. And um, in addition, of course, we'll need those uh, uh, commitments as well that we also spoke earlier. So this is still, um, if I can say, um, a, a medium term. So right now we have a short term and immediate need and urgent need, which we just spoke about, which is really, even if we call it charity, but the donation is really critical. The dose sharing is really critical to help cover the gap. At the same time, we need to really expand the production capacity, expand uh, the, uh, the diversification, geographic diversification of production. Uh, and we have seen successful examples. We need to do more. Thank you very much. Could, could we come to Heidi next, please? Heidi, you're still on mute. Sorry, rookie mistake there completely. I'll just say thank you, Baroness Brinton, for um, uh, the, your question and thank you for the panel for inviting me. I'm really excited to be able to speak here today. Um, you're right on your question. You asked about IP attracting a lot of attention, and I think it rightly has um, attracted attention because the core problem we are facing is a supply problem. And so when we talk about donations um, and COVAX, um, they alone are not sufficient. They are um, they're an immediate stopgap to stop the bleeding, but ultimately we do need to put in place the investment to build um, the kind of capacity, production capacity that we need to supply the world, not just this year, but for next year and the following years, because it's that's from, certainly from the previous session, you know, we are in this for the long haul. Um, and so we do need to address these issues. I mean, intellectual property is an entry barrier for competent producers around the world. We've heard manufacturers from Bangladesh, Canada, South Africa, Senegal, Denmark, you know, they're saying that they're ready to produce, but they're unable able to get access to the intellectual property and to the technology transfer. Um, and so that's why it's a really um, important issue. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. So that's our starting point. Um, and as others have already said, we do need technology transfer and the sharing of know-how. And I would urge that we would um, support the World Health Organization's efforts around this to use the World Health Organization as a convener to facilitate that technology sharing. Um, there is a couple of proposals, a couple of initiatives that the World Health Organization um, has started. One is uh, the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, or CTAP for short. Um, the idea behind the pool is to facilitate that technology um, transfer, but also the sharing of patent rights and um, know-how and knowledge and data, and all the things that you need to make for vaccines. Um, the other initiative um, of the World Health Organization that I believe we need to get behind is also the technology transfer hubs, um, building regional capacity um, and using this as an opportunity to, um, to um, and help to ramp up that scale up of production that we need. So these technology transfer hubs, I, I believe that the World Health Organization has said they've had 50 expressions of interest for these hubs, but these are mainly from the countries that want to host a hub. And um, then the, the, the need is there, the demand is there, but actually the, um, the owners of that IP and that technology are not cooperating. And so even though they've had 50 expressions of interest, they've had none of the owners of the mRNA technology investment um, into 
uh, manufacturing capability so that we can start investing in um, a globally distributed network of manufacturing that sees vaccines as global public goods. Um, and this kind of um, innovation, um, uh, you know, innovation such as mRNA would be a really good starting place um, to, start, to start building and investing in this capacity. And we've seen the market failures um, leaving global South countries um, completely um, out in the cold in terms of access. And so um, building capacity in the global South will help address that but, um, and, 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 and enable these um, uh, public manufacturing capabilities to be able to produce vaccines as global public goods and retain um, control um, over, over these facilities to ensure that vaccines um, are, um, do reach um, uh, communities that need them and do um, address public health needs rather than just um, financial returns, which is how the current system is currently set up. Um, Thank so you. Thank you. I'm very aware we're very tight on time. I'm sorry, Heidi. I, I wondered if um, Elsa Torello would like to, to comment as well. And then if there's time on this question, I'll come to Natasha. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. And I, I think that many people before me have already said more or less the same. And I just want to say, like, I, I agree there are two most urgent things. One is redistribute the available doses now. I mean, that is really what we can do on the short term to get as Gavin, I think, was saying, uh, get more doses in people's arms of what we have today. And there is many uh, that are unused, uh, and there will be more in the next coming months. And then today, start by, by, by uh, building uh, more capacity, waiving the patents, transferring that technology. It's not either or. It's all of that, because this is about preparedness. And in one year from now, in the worst case scenario, we will uh, need to revaccinate people, uh, possibly with new vaccines against different variants, etc. So we will need more, many more capacities. So we need to start building that today. If we had done it a year ago, we would not be in the situation where we are now. So for me, those things are not either or, but just as urgent to start in parallel. Thank you. And Natasha. Arella, hello, thank you. Um, so other than um, the issue about COVAX, I'd highlight um, the lack of export by vaccine making countries. And so that would be the US, uh, the UK and India. Um, none of those countries are exporting vaccines. Uh, the UK will say it's all down to contracts, uh, but the fact remains is that we make vaccines and we don't export it. Um, the third concern, the other concern I would raise and the most pressing one, would be the creaking supply chains um, for ingredients to make vaccines. We know there are global shortages of key items, bio bags, filters, tubing. Um, and some of the work I've been doing has been reporting on where uh, the, the actual production has either been threatened or actually hindered. Um, you it may not be aware, but in fact, um, the Novavax line in Britain, for example, is several weeks behind where it would have been because of shortages of key items. And um, we know that some of this is just down to shortages. We also know that US export controls through the Defense Production Act is also kind of gumming up uh, supply chains and causing problems all over the world. Uh, there's also been signs of problems with certain drug manufacturing that uses the same lines that may come to hit us later on this year. It's not the subject though now. Um, but what I would say is overall, we are expecting to be able to produce 10.9 billion doses of vaccine this year. That is all theoretical. And um, if these supply chains don't uh, keep functioning, then that won't manifest itself. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come to Manira Wilson. Thanks, Caroline. Um, it's very clear from the evidence we've heard today um, that uh, an approval of a TRIPS waiver wouldn't uh, necessarily resolve things in the immediate term. So could I ask if there were a TRIPS waiver approved, when would the impact of that be seen? I wonder perhaps if Natasha and Heidi were best placed to, to respond to that question. Well, I'll have a go. Um, I think there are very mixed opinions on when the impact would be felt. Um, popular theory is that it would take a long time to have an impact because um, you have to get a negotiation at the WTO. Uh, then you have to uh, get to the end of the year to amend, uh, sorry, then you have to amend domestic legislation in different countries. 
Um, one argument I have heard um, is that uh, it's going to help countries that are currently uh, in the business of trying to stand up manufacturing facilities. There's a big push on at the moment in Africa. And, um, you know, if there is the promise of an IP waiver, that certainly does remove some of the uncertainty uh, for the people who are investing in these facilities, um, whether that's a private investor or a government. Um, I, I, what I would say, uh, just to sort of, uh, you know, I do think we have to do all of these things. There has been a huge amount of technology transfer. I feel that there is a lot of uh, anti-pharma rhetoric uh, and directed towards uh, the lack of transfer of technologies to certain companies, whether it's Tiva or Incepta uh, in Brazil or Canada. And we don't know why those companies weren't chosen for tech transfer. What we do know is this, is there have been 214 tech transfer deals done this year for COVID vaccines. And if you speak to the people who are doing these tech transfers, they'll tell you they're at full capacity and they're doing as much as they can. Um, Stefan van Self from Moderna was saying he worries almost daily about whether he's stretching his teams too far. Incidentally, uh, a lot of these big firms are also doing deals at the moment privately, not privately, they're behind the scenes, they're talking to people about setting up facilities in other countries. We know they're talking about doing one in Africa. We heard recently Pfizer and BioNTech announced a new facility in Singapore. So we will see additional facilities set up around the world. Um, I don't think that it's uh, I, I'm not saying it's not a good idea to pursue an IP waiver at all. What we don't want to be is in a position in December of thinking this is actually awful and I wish we'd started six months ago. So um, it's certainly worth talking about, but what it's going to produce is uncertain, I think. Um, I think that if the CHIPS waiver were approved tomorrow, let's say, I think it's very difficult to say exactly how long we would see the impact. Um, that would also depend, a bit like what Tasha was saying, about the technology transfer. So you would, but what you would be getting is that you'd be removing that entry level barrier to start with. You'd be taking away um, the barriers around intellectual property, not just on the vaccines themselves, but on some of the materials and the ingredients and some of the processes and manufacturing processes that also are covered in intellectual property. Um, there's a whole minefield of intellectual property rights when it comes to trying to make vaccines and the materials that are needed and the processes that are needed and so the IP waiver would help deal with all of that um, uh, to, to, help, to help reduce that entry level barrier and then like and then as we've said we would need um, to supplement that um, barrier, to, to supplement that um, with technology transfer um, and the sharing of know-how. Um, and, you know, we've seen companies like Pfizer, Moderna that went from zero capacity from in terms of manufacturing mRNA vaccines um, to producing them at scale um, in huge numbers in just a matter of months. And so when the political will is there, when the kind of commercial will is there almost, you know, that you can make mountains move in that sense. But actually, for, you know, we are seeing in this, the global death toll rise at a kind of at a, at a, at a horrific rate um, and we need to sort of pull out all stops to make sure that we can um, ad address this and address the underlying production and supply problems um, and so I think for me this underlies underscores the importance of moving forward with the IP waiver negotiations as quickly as possible because the longer you wait the longer you're going to have you know other um, leading times to get that production up and running. Can I take my next question, uh, Chair? Um, just if we were to move ahead with this waiver, there is a lot of concern, and I think Natasha's already touched on it, on the impact this will have on the supply chain, supply of raw materials, the impact that would then have on developing um, uh, vaccines for new variants. There are also big concerns about quality and undermining quality and confidence in vaccines, as well as the regulatory hurdles for, for um uh, what would essentially be biosimilars as opposed to exact copies. So I just wondered if anybody on the panel could comment on what impact uh, it would, a sharing of IP would therefore have on development of those uh, new vaccines for variants going forward and the disruption it might have on existing manufacturing. Well, what we're hearing from, from the uh, pharmaceutical companies is that it would have a huge impact also from, from CEPI. What I would say is that you can't on the one hand say um, that the waiver is going to take, uh, you know, to the end of the year and say that if you give it 
uh, is going to have an immediate impact on the supply chains. It's either one or the other. And if we're going to, um, you know, plan for there to be a, a WTO over at the waiver at the end of the year, then we can also plan to deal with some of these uh, supply chain issues as well. So, um, you know, I don't, I, I think, you know, if, if you just didn't plan, yes, you would have problems, but um, let's plan for it. Maybe if I can add here, I mean, you're totally right, Natasha, if it's going to take until the end of the year for an IP waiver, uh, that, would that would make us all lose an incredible amount of precious time. There is no reason for it to have to last until the end of the year. If there was political willingness today, there could be an, an IP waiver, waiver tomorrow. I think the reason why one is saying that it might take until the end of the year is because there is no real political willingness yet. And there is the idea that we need to enter into lengthy negotiations, but that actually is a false argument. We could, if there was political will say, we all agree on an IP waiver on all uh, uh, COVID related medical technologies tomorrow and it would be there. So I think that the, the part of the political will and uh, it's related to how long uh, it might take. On the, on the supply chain, I totally agree. Uh, it, it is a critical element, but let's not forget that the IP waiver as Haley was already indicating would also release uh, intellectual property barriers around the manufacturing of a number of elements of that supply chain. Some of them are maybe not uh, under patented uh, technologies, but some of them are. And what I think we need uh, for first and foremost, and I don't know whether Gavin is still with us, uh, those that were imagining even before COVAX, but uh, uh, something else that would have been a global coordination mechanism on the R&D for new vaccines, not just what COVAX has become, the allocation and the, the purchase, but initially the idea had been with SAPI to create this global uh, coordination of R&D where we could indeed much more also coordinate what, uh, where the, 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 the priority uh, raw materials would be used, etc. That global coordination today we don't have and whether we have five or eight companies competing for these raw materials or we have more, it will be a, a competition. What we want is actually a much broader coordination and a planning of what are the vaccines that we need, uh, where and how many uh, to, to curb this pandemic. And it's not a market competition where every of the current vaccine producers are competing against each other, including for some of those raw materials. That is not the most effective way to ensure that we have the supplies we need. So I think we need to pull it back to that global coordination where I think WHO can play a role, where COVAX today can also play a role. Uh, and the more manufacturers we have, the more raw materials we need. And we need to ensure that this too can happen. It's not just the end products. It's also all the raw materials that we need to scale up in a sort of, sort of coordinated way. If I make an if I may can, uh, come up uh, uh, here, I just wanted to say that um, I agree, <coughs> I'm sorry, I agree that this is not either or, um, while negotiations are uh, ongoing, it is very important that we keep the focus on uh, solving the immediate problems. And this is very important because otherwise um, there might be lengthy negotiations. We need to make sure that we ensure access now. This is really critical. And when I talk about access now, it's not just on the dose sharing, on the expansion of production capacity, also to the point that was made earlier with regards to reducing any barriers to raw materials. This is a major, major concern because the increase of product production, the expansion of production capacity is subject to actually the raw materials. So this is actually one of the challenges that we're hearing a lot from many manufacturers. And that will be the first call also to manufacturers of product, uh, producing raw materials to really expand that production capacity, but also to the governments to lifting any barriers to such access, because this is actually uh, going to unlock, if I can say, uh, the more expansion uh, and production capacity. Thank you. I'm going to move us on just because I'm, I'm, I'm just very aware that we're short of time. So I'm going to come to Baroness Brady now. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my question is to Natasha. Um, Natasha, the vaccine program in the UK has been a huge success. I wondered how your perspective is that that is viewed by middle and low income countries. 
Well, first of all, I'll just say it's very difficult to generalise about so many countries, so I'll just try and keep my remarks confined to what I can say with certainty. Um, let's remember that last year, the context for many countries was that they understood it would take five to 10 years to create a vaccine. Um, even some of the optimists like Dr. Fauci were saying um, to 12 to 18 months timeline. So I think many countries were very surprised at the speed of the development. Um, a number of middle in income countries, though, find themselves uh, that make vaccines now find themselves in a position where the governments are being asked why they haven't done a better job in procuring vaccines. So I'm thinking about Brazil, India and South Africa. Um, they have the capacity to make vaccines. Indeed, of course, India does. Um, they've been asked why they haven't uh, done deals with firms that um, have done trials in their countries or planning to buy earlier. With regards to low income countries, um, I was talking to Dr. Sabin uh, Nassim Samana, who's the Director General of the Rwanda Biomedical Center um, yesterday. And they're very impressed with how fast uh, we've rolled out vaccines. They're very much less impressed with the sort of lack of access that they have to them. Um, they can roll out whatever they're sent. Um, they're also concerned about the shift in priority to vaccinating children. Um, and the sort of lack of concern about uh, healthcare workers in the elderly and poorer countries. And, you know, just, you know, the mood music in Africa has changed in the last month. If you listen to people like John Nkenga song and they are looking at what's happened in India with some alarm. India was supposed to have escaped. Um, the ravages of the coronavirus and now it's very clear that it hasn't and so there's great fear uh, that uh, there is a, a, you know potentially a wave of Covid coming to hit Africa and um, there are no vaccines they don't have access to vaccines and um, rich countries are really much more concerned about uh, vaccinating uh, their kids than they are making sure that healthcare workers uh, get vaccines. If you allow, I have a quote that I would like to share with you from someone from South Africa, uh, who I specifically asked uh, that question. It's uh, Fatima Hassan, who is the, the founder of the Health Justice Initiative. And she's, uh, she wrote me, well, we can't travel to the UK. They can come here. The difference is that they are mostly vaccinated, blocking the waiver, and we have just started. Yesterday, Archbishop Tutu got his job months after young and healthy people in the UK did. Why? Ask yourself why we have limited supplies. Why the UK stands on IP hoarding and overbuying meant that someone over 80 got his vaccine on the 18th of May 2021. Also, we took part in the AstraZeneca trial, the J&J trial, Pfizer trials and other, yet we were not guaranteed access. So much for the Commonwealth. That was her uh, comment. So I wanted to share that with you. Very powerful. Thank you. And just quickly um, as well, just um, just to say that we've been um, working um, with global campaigners across the world fighting for a people's vaccine, and there's a real sense that of our. Um, our friends um, and our colleagues in the global south just feel like they are um, at an utter a feeling of utter despair. Um, Achal Prahabla, who's a writer, researcher, and a campaigner for access to medicines in India, um, was sharing with us this kind of despair at the situation where he feels that he 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 knows there's so many people that he knows um, that has has lost someone, um, and everyone that he knows has um, the same experience. He says there's literally no exception. Everyone I know is in a perpetual state of panic as to who is next. It's like a culling of the elderly and the vulnerable, it's pure hell. Um, he, he, he said that he spoke to the AU's um, Africa Union's Vaccine Delivery Alliance um, co-chair, um, who says that they are in despair because they, um, their only chance of getting any vaccines at all will be in August, which is a whole three months away, and they have no idea whether this schedule will be maintained. Um, and so I think the overall sense that we're getting from our colleagues in the, in the global south is that they've, they're watching countries like the UK and the US and the EU um, hoard um, doses. Um, they have struggled to access those themselves. Companies are refusing to share their, their intellectual property and their know-how. Um, and meanwhile, rich country governments are blocking the proposals to suspend patents. If I can come in uh, here, I just want to say that the success in UK actually it does bring a, a huge amount of pop to countries because it does prove that actually immunization 
uh, prioritize immunization works and it helps also with the vaccine hesitancy. It, it gives a very strong message that if we prioritize immunization combined with other essential infection prevention and control measures, uh, previous session we talked about also very briefly, but also about diagnostic therapeutics. So there are many other uh, actually uh, measures that we have to, to combine to fight to, to fight this. So uh, I do think that uh, as UNICEF, we've been trying to track examples of success, such as uh, in UK, but other uh, places as well. Um, and this really helps uh, to share the, the knowledge, the experience across the countries and the learning. I think the COVAX has been quite successful in the rolling out initially uh, with the vaccine immediately nine days within the first uh, WHO approval of the, uh, of the UL listing. So within nine days, the first vaccines landed in Ghana. That's a major success in terms of rolling out in the low-income countries, knowing normally that how much and how long time it takes actually to, to bring vaccines there. But uh, we should not forget that, of course, as long as any community is uh, vulnerable, everyone is vulnerable. So the focus has to be how we together, uh, continuing with supporting COVAX with the solidarity, uh, funding is one, but also funding uh, uh, not just vaccines, but also the delivery, the rollout, uh, having countries prepared, because one of the challenges from the beginning was which types of vaccines technology can actually be contracted by the facility. Does Do the countries that we are working on have the actually the conditions to receive mRNA vaccine given the ultra cold chain and so on? So those have been initial barriers as well that actually needed in, uh, more funding, more investments in terms of uh, culture and capacity, uh, infrastructure and so on. So there are many factors that have actually uh, had a, uh, a, a impact in overall access, but by far the surge in India definitely and the complexities of supply chains overall uh, of the manufacturers have had an impact in terms of access. And we really count on, again, calling on immediate actions now, which will be the dose sharing, making sure that countries that were, are left behind to get the second dose can get those soon, uh, but also in terms of more sustainable actions uh, with regards to expansion of, uh, of uh, production uh, in continent as well, uh, but also making sure that not only sustainable in terms of countries uh, being able to produce their vaccines, but also that manufacturers are successful because we have seen uh, that in years, in decades, when it comes to vaccines, this is very complex. We don't want to see manufacturer exit exiting markets. So we ha also have to manage this quite carefully. We're seeing a lot of excess production. I'm going to probably. stop you there. I'm so sorry Thank to you. stop you there. But we're just beginning to really run out of time now. Thank you very much. And over to Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Chair. And I'll actually come back to start with Eva and then Els. Um, COVAX has delivered 60 million vaccine doses, which is less than a quarter of what was planned. We've touched on both IP waivers and technology transfer. Are there other technical issues we should be considering? And thinking back to the eradication of smallpox and as yet the near eradication of polio, do you think there's enough recognition of the need for a genuine global response in light of the risk of future pandemics? Thank you so much uh, for this question. Absolutely, there is a need for global response. Uh, I think a global response uh, together that we did uh, as the international community for Ebola made us uh, actually able to have a stockpile for Ebola and be able to respond even in the recent Ebola outbreak uh, just in last year. So definitely that is needed and therefore it, uh, uh, COVAX I think is the answer to a global response to uh, be there to respond to, to, the, to the needs. The, we spoke about the IP and uh, the expansion of production. We also touched upon the raw materials, which is absolutely uh, very essential as well. Uh, but we, uh, we talked a little bit about the export barriers and this is very important to uh, establish that mechanism 
that there are no barriers to an international effort uh, such as COVAX, for example, in terms of accessing uh, supply so that we can respond to countries. We would have had uh, today delivered, maybe by the end of this week, more than 170 million doses. Uh, so really, we look forward to uh, coming together as international community to unlock this situation. And if I can come to you, else. Yeah, maybe one thing to add here is that, I mean, COVAX is, as we said earlier uh, today, a mechanism for the procurement and allocation and distribution, mostly to uh, low-income countries, although with a self-financing mechanism, it's a bit broader. But that's only one part of the, of the pipeline. And I, I really think we need to, uh, for that longer-term perspective, think about, for instance, the recent recommendation of the independent panel that you may have seen, a panel that was set up by the World Health Assembly uh, to recommend to the World Health Organization, who clearly recommend that we need to set up an end-to-end -end, uh, pandemic preparedness and research and development ecosystem that actually can ensure that we actually, for the future, are much more ready uh, through our R&D system to develop the needed tools, vaccines, diagnostics, and other uh, measures in a way that is not following the market logic, but that actually is fit for purpose to deliver uh, global health commons, public goods that then can be managed and distributed as common goods and, and, and uh, through COVAX or other mechanisms, but to really link the innovation incentives with developing public goods. And I think that that is really a, a, an incredibly important uh, response that actually is also built upon our learnings from uh, Ebola. How can we ensure that we can actually leverage all our technology and science for the public good and then use those technologies as public goods and not as commodities, which result in all the inequities that we see today. Thanks very much. I don't know if Heidi or Natasha have anything specific they want to add. Um, I just wanted to quickly say just about COVAX and the ambitions of COVAX are really just to vaccinate 20% um, of the populations um, that are a member of the AMC by the end of this year. And actually 20% is nowhere near enough um, to get herd immunity in those countries. Um, and so I think that we do need to, you know, COVAX is a, is a, is a, is a, is a program that pulls demand, but it doesn't have an answer for production. And so we do need that production and distribution to go hand in hand. Um, we need to solve the production to unlock the doses for, for COVAX to even begin to purchase. And I, and I am concerned that COVAX is only aiming for 20%. And I don't know what the global plan is to enable all countries to reach herd immunity levels. You know, I, I know that the, the levels, um, I've heard 60, 70% um, in, by different, by range of experts, um, but we really need a global plan that helps us achieve that kind of ambition rather than just 20%, which is, you know, nowhere near enough. Uh, particularly when they estimate we could face some form of pandemic or epidemic every decade, which if you look back, you know, those organisms have been there. I don't know if you have anything you want to add, Natasha, before we move on. Well, just briefly, I mean, in terms of the immediate global response, I mean, it seems quite clear that there is a big multilateral response being planned. Um, you know, in the Biden announcement, it's actually 80 million doses in total that they're going to donate. They did talk about a multilateral response that's being worked on with um, the EU, the UK, other countries. And I sort of have a sense that this is all planned for the G7. There's going to be some sort of big announcement, but it's kind of coming a little bit too late. And, uh, you know, I, I suppose you know, later you're going to ask our recommendations, but I do, I do think the UK does need to sort of hurry up and not wait to the G7 to start announcing what it's going to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Coming now to Lord Russell. Yes, um, we'd be, thank you very much, all four of you. Um, we've spoken quite a bit about supply chain issues. Could we just move to regulatory issues? And I want particularly to ask Ava about this. Regulatory barriers um, are different in different parts of the world. Regulatory authorities work in different ways. How is COVAX planning to overcome that and to make that as seamless and as fast as possible? Thank you so much. Um, actually, um, this time around has been really unprecedented uh, collaboration to align the regulatory requirements for the 
uh, for the COVID vaccine, which is unusual than you know what has been before. Um, there has been a lot of uh, considerable reliance on the technical assessment uh, and uh, by other regulators. So in particular, very close collaboration between WHO prequalification and the uh, European Medicine Agency. This has been really almost hand to hand. And that has led to really minimum uh, delays, minimal delays between the issuance of uh, conditional marketing authorization by EMA to the WHO uh, EUA listing. Equally the same uh, when it comes to countries, uh, we have seen a very strong reliance again on the technical assessment by all uh, uh, AMC 92 countries. Uh, they have provided immediately import authorization and acceptance of the COVID-19 vaccine as soon as it has been WHO UL uh, approved. So this has been really in a record time and we haven't seen this before. Um, and including also countries are relying so much on WHO inspections and are not doing their own dossier assessment and inspection for manufacturers, which also reduce the cost for manufacturers as well that used to, to do in every single country as they register their, uh, their products. So I I think we have seen a lot of progress on that uh, as well. Of course, there is need for uh, always more reliance and working uh, across SRAs uh, across the world. But I think overall, uh, we have seen really uh, positive uh, progress. And lastly, I want to say that WHO has also published packaging and labeling for vaccines, which has been done in collaboration with manufacturers um, and regulators. And this has been also a good progress in terms of uh, cutting any uh, delays or barriers with regards to, uh, to the countries where we work. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very comprehensive reply. And unless any of the remaining three of you have anything to add, I will go straight back to Caroline. Thank you very much. So then we're coming to Baroness Marsham for the last question. What is your key message to the UK government? What must, must um, it do to ensure that vaccines are available across the world? I know we need speed and urgency. So perhaps you can all say your piece. What should we do? Come to Else first. Yes, I think as many of us have said, the most urgent is like, if you would show the example to not even wait for the uh, G7, but say now that you're going to redistribute the doses that you have, uh, for instance, 20% uh, as was the recommendation of the independent panel and immediately uh, give that to COVAX and at the same time start working on that longer term solution, but that is for this pandemic, it's not for the next pandemic, but for uh, relieving uh, intellectual property and start building capacity and technology transfer at the same time. That can be done tomorrow. Next one. Uh, Natasha? Um, all right, yes, yeah, so there's a couple of things uh, I wanted to say. Um, I, I'd just like to say we as UK taxpayers spent £549 million supporting COVAX and we've watched this mechanism uh, run dry of doses. Um, we've heard the problems. In fact, we actually even went to India uh, to fill uh, our uh, vials with 5 million doses from uh, the Serum Institute, which cut into, uh, which pushed COVAX further down the line. And we've seen countries um, all over the world, Norway, France, Belgium, Spain, UAE, New Zealand, Switzerland, and now the US donate uh, to COVAX and make commitments to COVAX. And what have we done? We've done absolutely nothing. Um, so it's incredibly disappointing. And um, the other thing I just wanted to point out, because it hasn't been asked directly, um, COVAX is uh, projecting that it's going to have a billion doses in Q4, um, which is a lot. And it could stretch COVAX's ability to deploy those doses. So basically, it's going to get all its doses towards the end of the year. So uh, we have at the moment this mechanism sitting idle for want of doses. Now, the UK may want doses towards the end of the year in the winter uh, when there are more around. And it just seems to me that there has to be a much more sensible and logical way of doing this rather than allowing COVAX to sit on its hands. Um, in terms of... I mean, I think we all know what really needs to happen. We need to donate. I'd like to see the manufacturers also um, encouraged or at least highlighted where they're not releasing countries from uh, contracts. 
I'd like to see them also encouraged to fulfill more contracts or fill more contracts with COVAX. Um, you know, we're seeing, uh, well, Pfizer, for example, has promised COVAX 40 million doses. They've sent 960,000 doses, but they still managed to find the doses down the back of the sofa to vaccinate the Tokyo Olympians. So, you know, really, I, and, you know, and I speak to people uh, behind the scenes and what they say is that we hear Moderna's are doing a new bilateral deal with someone or Pfizer's doing a new bilateral deal. How come they didn't come to us? So I think um, we need to kind of get the manufacturers, and put them a little bit more in the spotlight. And maybe because we don't feel so beholden to them now, we've all been vaccinated. Uh, maybe we can um, hold them up to a little bit more scrutiny. Thank you. Very clear. Heidi? Um, yeah, I, I think that we need to break these pharmaceutical monopolies. We're in the middle of a pandemic, a global health crisis, and the last thing we need is monopolies. We actually need the opposite. We need to um, to, to mobilise and, and as many manufacturers as possible to ramp up supplies. And so I would urge the government to support the full IP waiver. So that's the, that, that, that includes all health technologies, not just vaccines, but vaccines, treatment, diagnostics, PPE, um, and, to, and it also includes all relevant IP, and to negotiate that at speed. Um, and I'd also get the I'll call on the government to support the WHO's COVID-19 technology access pool and technology transfer hubs to help facilitate um, technology transfer. That's very useful. Um, we mustn't forget all the other things apart from the vaccines. Coming to Ava now for the end. Yes, thank you. So I think uh, for the UK government, in order for them to sustain the gains of your successful domestic immunization, it is very important that we do dose sharing now. So if the UK government can give 20% of dose sharing to the COVAX and also advocate for the Team Europe to do the same, that is going to bridge the gap that we have right now. Secondly, love if the UK government can also advocate to the manufacturers to prioritize COVAX and put that in the pipeline as a, in the front queue. And uh, lastly, I want to say that um, if UK government can support more that countries with a funding delivery, again, not just for vaccine, but for the rollout, so preparing the infrastructure, supporting the health workers, but also supporting with diagnostic therapeutics and other protective equipments. It's not just vaccine alone, it is all other interventions together. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. Yes, let me just just thank you. The, the session is now at an end, but I do want to thank so, all of you so much for, for such rich and, and powerful evidence that you've given us. I think we've drawn some very, very clear messages from what you've, what you've said. So, so very many thanks and uh, all the very best with all of your work. Thank you.